dementia researcher with a blog and a rating. You may have noticed that in recent months that more and more conferences are promising an in-person experience this year. For me, this is extremely exciting. I love to attend a conference and really miss seeing my friends, colleagues and collaborators. There's no better place to make new connections, see some exciting new data and let your hair down than at a conference. Some of my closest collaborators are people that I met in the pub after the end of that day's sessions. I always take the opportunity to go to one. First, however, you need to submit your conference abstract. In most cases, your institute will only send you to a conference because they have to pay if you're going to present something. That means you have to prepare and submit an abstract. So how do you do that? In this month's blog, I'll give you the best tips to write the perfect abstract. Let's start with the basics. Conference abstracts always have rules and guidelines and you must follow them. They often have strict limits on either word count or number of pages, and you will normally find a rigid structure that they want you to follow. Most conference websites provide a handy abstract template that you can download, so I would recommend using that. They usually want every abstract to be in the same format, so make use of that resource, but generally they'll constitute an introduction, methods, results and discussion, and conclusions or future perspectives section. Never exceed the page limit or word count. This is a really critical point. The point of an abstract is is to demonstrate to the organisers that you have exciting and interesting work and you can communicate it in a concise and effective way. How can they expect you to stick to a 10 minute presentation time limit if you cannot write about your findings in less than 500 words? If you exceed the page or word limit, expect your abstract to be rejected and you don't want that. So how do you condense your work into 500 words or a single page? Let's start with page limits. Firstly, you don't always need to include figures or data in an abstract. Most abstract guidelines include statements like figures and tables should be only used where necessary to substantiate results. This means that in most cases, simply describing the data you will intend to present is sufficient. Figures take up a lot of space, and if you're working to something like a strict one page limit, you may need to use that space for text as opposed to figures. Most figures will be reproduced in black and white anyway, so if you wanted to use something like a nice image of cells, the effect will be lost in grayscaling. The next tip will help you meet both page and word limits. Be clever with your text. The point of an abstract is to be concise, so get to the point quickly. For your introduction, try not to spend more than four or five lines describing the background behind the issue you want to try and solve, followed by a line or two that broadly frames your work. Something like, this study presents an approach for, and so on. For your method section, you don't need to write a stepwise protocol with materials and equipment sources, you just have to outline the techniques you use to collect your data. If you go to the text version of this blog, you'll find an example of a method section. For the results and discussion, the same principle applies. Be nice and concise. A good rule of thumb is one to two sentences per data set that you are describing. Finally, you want to format your abstract in a way that saves space. Unless they state you have to, avoid double spacing. Keep your affiliations as short as possible and make your reference section small. Normally there's a minimum font size in an abstract template, but you can usually make your references smaller than this because they're not part of the abstract body. Small text in columns. If you do this, you can get your references down to as little as a single line. Another key thing to remember is that the conference you're submitting to will have a target audience. Your work might bridge multiple disciplines or areas of focus. Larger conferences have a much broader audience, so you have to do less tailoring. But if you're attending a smaller, more focused meeting, the organisers will have a very clear idea of the themes they want to cover in the programme. It's important to read this before you start writing your abstract to make sure your work fits in with what they're looking for. If it does, make sure you present your work in a way that fits nicely with their areas of focus. For context, I'm about to read two examples of the opening lines for abstracts submitted to one conference that focuses on cell biology and Alzheimer's disease, and another conference that focuses on using biomaterials approaches to study disease. So one conference is more biology approached, while the other is more engineering focused, but both these examples are presenting exactly the same work. So the opening line for the biology abstract is, induced pluripotent stem cells provide a promising platform for modeling neurodegenerative diseases. Isolation of stem cells from patients is non-invasive, and neural differentiation can yield neurons bearing in vivo pathologies. So lots of biology there. Now this exact same work submitted to a biomaterials abstract starts with, alginate has previously shown a promise as a neural cell scaffold to structural similarities to hyaluronic acid, a primary component of brain exercise matrix. A lack of cell adhesion 
In the native structure, however, means alginate often has to be modified for neural cell culture applications. So two very different openers, but both present exactly the same study. It's all about how you frame the work. It's also important to remember that conferences are a place to get others excited about what you are doing. When you write your abstract, sell it. This doesn't mean you need to claim that you have the cure for Alzheimer's, but make sure whoever reads it understands why you're doing what you're doing, why it's important, and how it's different to what others are doing. You can do this a bit in your introduction, but you can really drive it home in the conclusion section. Make it clear that your work is worth sharing and you have exciting future plans. You can be broad, but just let them know that your work has got legs. And the last and perhaps most important point is to proofread your abstract multiple times. Spelling mistakes make you look sloppy and gives the impression that you don't really care. If you did, you'd make sure everything was right. So ensure you've not got any grammatical or spelling errors and then send it on to your supervisor so that they can read it as well. They will want to see it before you send it and they may pick up on some errors that you didn't notice yourself. Sometimes a second set of eyes is really useful. Eventually, you'll have an abstract that both you and your supervisor or supervisors are happy with. Make sure that's the case before you send it. Your PI will be very unhappy if you submit something without their approval, especially if it has their name on it. Once you have that, submit and forget about it. Agonising over whether it will be accepted is of no benefit, so carry on with your work, await the verdict, and good luck. And if you enjoyed this week's blog but want more tips, there's links to other useful posts in the text version of the article on the Dementia Researcher website. Thank you for listening. Join the Dementia Research bloggers and share your own views.